thought I was recording again and I wasn't. Um, Hi friends. So I said we were going to read 29 and 30. We just left off at chapter 28 with um, Isabel about to climb out a window and we're thinking she's gonna kind of just walk up to a British officer and say, hey, I wanna be free and can you give me a job? And her current plan seems to be to do that and then save up money and um, go to Nevis to get Ruth. Um, but we can find a lot of faults with that plan. So let's see what actually happens. 29 and 30. All right, the day is Sunday, September 15th, 1776. I think that's the date that the uh, British win or maybe just, hmm, let's see. Journal of Private Joseph Plum Martin, 15 year old Patriot soldier. The demons of fear and disorder seemed to take full possession of all and everything upon that day. I was the only person on the street. The army was gone and the city abandoned. I shivered through, though the day was still warm. Had I made a mistake? Should I run after the rebels and join them? Should I go back to the Lockton's? A cannon boomed to the north. No, I chose the right course, at least I hoped I had. I headed for the waterfront. Several of the grand mansions of Lower Broadway stood with their doors ajar. A fire burned at the edge of the street heaped with books and scads of paper. The smoke rose up into the air, drifting toward the masts of the few ships at anchor. Cannons boomed again. What if they didn't arrive right away? How long did I have before Madame grew suspicious? A gust of wind blew and carried with it the first hint of fall. Canoe-shaped chestnut leaves turned yellow round at the edges. The leaves caught and piled up against the soldiers' tents left behind at the battery campground. I walked over and pulled back the flap of a tent. Inside lay two bedrolls, a pipe and tobacco pouch, and a shirt dropped in the middle of mending, the needle still threaded and stuck in the fabric. I closed the flap. They left near everything, tents, blankets, extra clothing, cookpots, and food. It would be a cold night for Curzon and his companions. Voices came from the waterfront, military voices shouting orders. I hurried away from the barracks, dashed down Water Street, and hid behind a rain barrel at the corner of the joiner's workshop. A half dozen flat-bottomed boats were being rowed to the docks. Two were already tied up, and tall soldiers wearing the red uniform of King George were striding down the street. Lobsterbacks, folks called them. They fanned out across the waterfront, their muskets primed and held at the ready position. As I watched, a third boat floated to the wharf. The soldiers in it jumped out and marched in formation to the battery in search of rebel soldiers. A woman carrying a baby fled, screaming loudly. A few of the redcoats chuckled and stabbed at the air with their bayonets. My throat went dry. As the fourth boat landed, an officer stepped off and barked a command at the laughing men. They lined up and stood at attention. The officer gave another command and the men marched off, splitting into three groups to investigate the battery and waterfront buildings. The officer stood alone at the front of the dock, surveying the deserted town as more boats splashed toward the landing spot. This was my chance. I forced myself out of my hiding place and walked toward him, my back ramrod straight. Begging your parder, pardon, sir, I said boldly. What is it, girl, he asked. Before I could answer, a soldier dashed up to him. Captain Campbell, sir, the campground appears deserted. The rebels left behind their tents and bedrolls. Secure the tent flaps open and check every one, the captain commanded. It could be a trap. Yes, sir, came the crisp reply before the man ran off. I prayed I would not faint from fear and tried again for the captain's attention. I can cook, sir, I said. I can wash, so even doctor the sick a, ch a little. Don't bother me, child. I trailed after him as he walked toward the campground. Please, sir, I insisted. I'm all kinds of useful. I can chop wood and carry water or messages. I was interrupted by another soldier who approached us and saluted. Report, Captain Campbell said. The spies were correct, sir. The rebels have retreated. The battery is empty of men, but filled with the provisions and weapons they left behind, including several cannons. They even left a tea kettle bubbling over the fire. Civilians in the first three streets north of here all attest to their haste. Putnam's unit was the last one out. They're on their way to the, up the island by way of the Greenwich Road. 
Do we pursue, sir? The captain fought the smile that played at the corner of his lips. Our task is to occupy the city. We'll let the Highlanders hunt them down. Tell the men to take over the barracks and prepare Washington's headquarters for Major General Robertson. Yes, sir, the soldier saluted again, but did not move. What is it now, Jennings, asked the captain. Begging pardon, sir, but I have not been informed as to the whereabouts of Washington's headquarters. If I was to be given that information, I could pursue my obligations with greater speed. I don't know where it is, Captain Campbell said with irritation. Use your noggin, man. Ask the tavern keeper. You want the Kennedy Mansion, sir, I said, just beyond the end of the battery, facing the bowling green. What did you say? The captain fired at me. My knees were shaking under my skirt. The Kennedy Mansion, sir. That was General Washington's main headquarters, number one Broadway. His wife stayed up at the Mortier House, but he kept headquarters straight that away. I pointed west and more army offices were in the city hall. I pointed north, up Broad Street. Very good, he said. There you have it, Sergeant, proceed. The Sergeant yelled to his unit as he walked away from us. The waterfront was awash in red now as boatloads of soldiers disembarked. Shouted orders filled the air along with nervous laughter and the sound of British boots on the cobblestones. A few more boats were on their way in with the first boats headed back for more. The occupation was well and truly begun. You are correct, young miss, Captain Campbell said to me. You are useful, but we do not want troublemakers in camp. What is the meaning of the mark on your face? I touched the raised scar and decided that honesty was my only course. This stands for insolence, sir. When my mistress sold my little sister, I tried to run away. She is five years old, sir, my sister, not my mistress. He blinked and cleared his throat. Regrettable and understandable. I have a younger sister myself. Your mistress, am I to assume she supports the rebel cause? No, sir, I answered, our house is Tory. My master was driven out of town by the Patriot leaders. My mistress is much cheered by your rival. She wants to hire a proper staff so she can entertain again. She'll not miss my services one bit. The words tumbled out before I measured them. The captain's mouth hardened and I knew I had stepped wrong. He tugged on his sash. I cannot accept your service, child. We only employ slaves run away from rebel owners. I did not hear him right. Pardon me? Gentlemen docking, sir, cried a soldier on the, route, on the wharf. Captain Campbell turned as the men tossed thick ropes from the dock to the occupants of the next boat. It contained only four soldiers, each manning an oar. The rest of the passengers were men dressed in expensive civilian clothes. When they're ashore or escort them into the tavern for a celebration, Captain said loudly. Issue the tavern keeper in an office of forged certificate. Warn him, Sergeant. He is not to ask the gentleman for payment unless he wants to spend this night in irons. They are our guests. Yes, sir, came the enthusiastic response. As we had been talking, ordinary city folk had begun to creep out of their houses. Now there was a full crowd gathered. The Tories of New York, who had been awaiting this day for months, years, Cheers were heard in the distance. The arriving soldiers were greeted by townsmen who shook their hands and patted them heartily on the back. I recognized a few faces, the Reverend and his wife and a few people who had called at the Lockton home. Captain Campbell bent toward me. He spoke quickly and quietly. I do not hold with slavery, but I cannot help you. We do not interfere with loyalist property. Return to your mistress. A loud huzzah from hundreds of throats came from the battery as the American flag was pulled down. A drummer started beating time and the Union Jack rose to the top of the flagpole, accompanied by whistles and shouts from the lobsterbacks and loyalist New Yorkers who took off their hats in respect. A woman in the crowd snatched the American flag out of the hands of the British soldiers and stomped it under her boots. The men laughed. The rat-a-tat-tatting of the drumsticks rattled through me, setting my teeth to shaking and waking the bees who had lately gone to sleep in my brain pan. He couldn't take me, he would not. I was chained between two nations. The bees swarmed again behind my eyes, making the scene grow dim and distant. The sun was nearing the horizon, casting long shadows across the wharf. I was a ghost tied to the ground, not a living soul. All ashore, sir, called the soldier trying up the last, tying up the last boat. All ashore, corporal, the captain acknowledged. I want patrols assembled immediately to keep watch in the streets and sentry fires built on every corner. Yes, sir. The gentleman who had arrived on the boat walked toward us, talking with great excitement. 
One of them was painfully familiar. He called to me before I could flee. Sal, called Master Elihu, locked in, thinner from his exile, eyes bloodshot and wary. Is that you? I dropped into a curtsy and dared not say a word. He studied on me with suspicion. What are you doing here? Sergeant Jennings approached. The tavern is open if the gentleman would care to drink to victory. Locked and waved to his companions. I shall join you, sir, shortly. As the gentleman hurried to the tavern, his eyes traveled from my head down to my shoes and back. What news, Sal? He asked. How do you come to be here? I pulled Madame's list from my pocket and prayed he would not look inside my basket. Come to market, sir, I whispered. Ah, what is this? He took my chin in his fingers, turning it so that the last rays of the sunset fell on my scar. Is the eye for illustrious or perhaps impertinent? My face burned, both in the scar and where his lavender-smelling fingers pinched my skin. The bees flew through me and told me to grab Campbell's sword and run it through Lockton's belly. And then what? And then what? I suspect it stands for insolence, Captain Campbell said calmly. Tis a common brand among the people of Boston. Lockton laughed at the small joke and released me. Now we'll call her Insolent Sal, a very saucy gal. The captain smiled and put his hand on the hilt of his sword. I should have known she was attached to your household, sir. She greeted me in the name of the king and thanked me for rescuing the city from the rebels. They both looked at me. We pray for liberation, I said. Even our slaves have become political, Lockton said. How quaint. Do you wish to accompany your servant home to greet your mistress, the captain asked. Lockton shook his head. Not at the moment. Go on home, Sal. Tell Anne I shall be along after I've lifted a few glasses in celebration. The two men headed for the tavern as the sun finally dropped out of sight. I must have gone to Mason's and bought the items on Madame's list, though I remember it not. My body moved through the streets, past sentry fires and redcoats, carrying torches down suspicious alleys and into abandoned houses. Around me was the sound of the victors celebrating and the smell of meat they roasted for their supper. Around me, all was darkness. Chapter 30. This is a letter from New York in the Morning Chronicles and London Advertiser newspaper. Oh, the houses in New York, if you could but see the insides of them, occupied by the dirtiest people on, on a continent. If the owners ever get possession again, I am sure they will be in years, be years in cleaning them. The British army paraded up Broadway the next day, cheered by loyalists all wearing a red ribbon or flower in their hats in support of the king. I did not see this, of course. I overheard the report that Madame gave the master as they ate supper and that eve with their house guests, the two officers who had moved into the bedchambers on the top floor. The highest ranking men of the British army had taken over the empty rebel mansions. Lower grade officers had moved in with loyalist families who had suitable furniture and staff, such as the Lockton's. Only we didn't have a staff. Becky had vanished, her rooms at the Oliver Street boarding house abandoned. I was the only servant in the house. It mattered not, my bones were hollow sticks, my brain pan empty. I cooked a chicken and roasted potatoes and carrots. I left the chicken over the fire too long because Madame ordered the silver polished and the table linens ironed in honor of her guests. The bird was so dry, it nearly splintered the tongues of the officers. Madame let loose on me in the kitchen after the gentleman had taken Master Lockton to Ashley's Tavern for a night of beer, drinking and pipe smoking. It mattered not. When Madame finished scolding me, I set to my evening chores, cleaning out the ashes from the bedchamber fireplaces and carrying them outside, bringing in the firewood and laying the fires in case the night turned cold, turning down the beds, cleaning up from supper and sweeping the floor. When I finally laid down to sleep, I set Ruth's doll beside my head. I had stopped kissing it goodnight. I did not say prayers. My bones were hollow and my brain pan empty. Madame ran me like a donkey all the next day, then demanded that I stay awake all night to make rolls for breakfast because the bakers in town were rebels and they had fled. I did as she ordered and ruined two perfectly fine bashes of dough. I threw them down the privy and baked cornbread deep in the night, for that was the one thing my hands knew how to bake. The cornbread burned to charcoal when I fell asleep head on the table. It mattered not. Three mornings after the invasion, a message was delivered to the master as I served the coffee. I set the note on a small silver tray and carried it into the drawing room. The officers were in the middle of excusing themselves from the table, buttoning up their coats and putting on their hats. After the master said his good days to them, he opened the note. A social invitation, Madame asked, or business? Neither, Lockton said. It's a desperate plea. 
He handed the note across to his wife. Aunt C Seymour is in need of our sow. All of her Dutch girls fled and she is without servants. Madame snatched the paper from his hand. Surely she can do for herself. We have company. Why should we go without a servant? We have only two men lodging here. Somehow Aunt has managed to take on a dozen Hessian brutes. She requires our assistance. Madame gave a little shudder. Hessians. The hired soldiers from Germany had a fearsome reputation. She crumpled the paper. I will not perform housework like a common wench. Tell her to hire someone. The times demand sacrifices, Anne, just for a week or so. Women will soon come to the city looking for work, and you and your our aunt will be able to hire a full staff. Madame scowled into her cup. You favor her over me, Elihu. It's unseemly. Lacton wiped his mouth with his serviette. The loan of the girl is the least we owe her. I hope you regret your decision to send away the sister. Even small hands would be helpful now. His mention of Ruth so startled me, I near dropped the tray. Madame bit back the hot words in her mouth, picked up her serviette and cleaned off her chin. You will clean the kitchen and prepare the dinner girl. Then you will take yourself to the house of Lady Seymour and do what she requires of you. Lockton shook his head. No, Sal, you will leave immediately. I took a clean apron and Ruth stall with me to Lady Seymour's house. In truth, I did not walk there quickly. In truth, I dawdled something fierce. Folks said that Hessian soldiers were fire-breathing monsters who walked about with swords drawn and blood on their chins. I figured that would be as bad as Madame. I was near correct. They did not breathe fire, though they spat when they talked. Nor did they walk about waving their swords, though some sported knives in their boots. None had blood on their chins, except when they ate raw, rare cooked meat. I found it hard not to stare at the enor enormous mustachios that sprouted under their noses especially when the men combed and waxed them and twirled at the ends. Their speech sounded like they were swallowing rocks, but Lady Seymour understood them. She learned the German from her husband, she said, same way she learned the Dutch. There are all manner of secrets locked in that old skull. When I served them supper my first night, a couple of them said Dank to me. Lady Seymour explained that Danke is German talk for thank you. She told me not to be afeared, that they were just soldiers far away from home. A couple of them were fond of her cat, she pointed out. How could men who liked cats be bad? She tolerated them fair enough, except for the muddy boots on the furniture, and they spread butter on their bread with their thumbs. That made her gasp and go pink in the face. I practiced saying Danka when alone. The work at the Seymour house is every bit as tiring as it had been at Madame's, more so because there were months, more mouths to feed and boots to clean and basins to fill and linens to wash and coats to be beat free of dust. Lady Seymour made sure I ate a proper meal three times a day and let me sleep in the tiny attic bedchamber on the bed where I laid after my time in the stocks. It was hot up there, but there were no mice nor worms in the floor when it rained. The city swelled by the hour with loyalist refugees who wanted to live under the protection of British cannons. Some of the folk returned from exile were surprised to find strangers had taken over their house and were sleeping in their beds and wearing the clothes they left behind. There were many fistfights, a great deal of name calling and, a threat, and threats of duels. The British didn't mix in with the arguments. They had war on the brain, drilling their soldiers from sunup to sundown. At the middle, Middle Dutch church, they pulled out the pulpit, the pews and the floorboards and let the horses of the light dragoons practice. Horses in a house of the Lord made some folks grumble, including Lady Seymour. Up to the tea water pump, I found only unfamiliar faces, slaves who had freed themselves by joining the British. I could not bring myself to speak to them. The old man we call grandfather had vanished. Maybe he had started his own revolution and led Curzon and the other slaves over the River Jordan to freedom. A fanciful notion, it was useless to ponder such things. Friday stretched long and longer because the Hessians had moved in five more of their countrymen. I heard Lady Seymour arguing with the fellow in charge, but he would not listen to her pleas. I spent the afternoon chopping a field's worth of cabbage while a half pig roasted in the pit dug by the men in the flower garden. The soldiers ate their supper and drank more beer than I thought a body could hold. They lost the few manners they possessed and used the table linings for blows at blowing their noses. It was a relief when they finally left for merrymaking elsewhere. I prepared a tray of supper and served it to Lady Seymour in her bedchamber, the one room where she could find peace. 
When my chores were done, I climbed to my attic room, kicked off my shoes, and laid down on the bed without even removing my skirt or bodice. Ruth's doll lay next to my head, her eyes stared up at, staring up at the ceiling. I knew I ought pray for Ruth, or for Mama, or for anything. I ought just pray, but the words would not come. I feared the spirit had left me. I slept. When I woke, the city of New York was consumed with burning hellfire. All right, read, reread, jot, and we will discuss these two chapters tomorrow. Looking forward to it.